Hi there, I'm Jennifer Kirk and it's really good to have you along here. We're going to be doing a question and answer session and this is in response to a good number of my Patreons have put forward some questions. So I'm going to take this opportunity to answer their questions first because if you're a Patreon you get priority in the queue and also a few other questions that have been asked to me over the last couple of weeks. So, you know, pick and choose and uh, we'll go through. So first up, this is from Z Mark Anthony. So uh, I, I don't know, is there a Cleopatra? I don't know, a little bit of a Shakespeare joke going on there, but uh, Mark Anthony is uh, he's excited to ask, so that's really good. And uh, I'm excited to be asked as well, actually, it must be said. What's your favourite locomotive of all time? Wow, that's a tricky. I'm going to divide this question into two parts. Uh, first up, favourite locomotive in general out there, whether it's available in model form or not. Oh gosh, um, I really actually quite like um, diesel shunters, a uh, particular soft spot for things like the Class 3 and the Class 4 diesel shunters, but also the Class 7. In terms of steam locomotives, uh, it's probably got to be, oh, I'm not really sure. Um, maybe I ought to put in there a West Country class because um, it's actually the first and the only steam locomotive that I've managed to ride in the cab of. I have been in the cabs of uh, um, Hunslet Austerities quite a few times. There's one at Kevin Coyd Colliery in South Wales that as a child I used to get taken there because my grandparents lived in the next valley and um, so I suppose I've got a soft spot for them as well but absolute most favourite um, I think I'm going to go with the, the Hunslet Austerity because of that locomotive at Kevin Coyd Colliery. Uh, standing on the footplate of that um, as a small child, it probably was quite an influence to me. So, yeah, Hunslet Austerity. In model form, however, um, I do quite like the Hunslet Austerities, but the Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway Pug is probably one that keeps on coming up again and again. And I just really have a soft spot for that model. It's kind of cute. And even though it's probably getting a little bit long in the tooth, um, really do like that. And I've got quite a few. So um, they keep cropping up, actually, in the background in certain videos. And I do mention them a lot. So, yeah, let's go uh, Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway Pug. So question two, uh, Mark Anthony asks, uh, have you ever heard of the Halo games? Yes, yes I have. Um, there's probably, I'm looking around this room actually, you can probably see up there we've got a SNES, but what you can't see is uh, further up here we've got um, game upon game. And just to, to prove to you, just pulled them randomly off the shelf, a couple of random PS2 games. Um, Gaming is Zoe's thing, so yes, I've heard of Halo and Master Chief and all of that kind of thing, but it's not one that I really play. Um, I gave up playing computer games when I graduated from university, in fact, probably just before my exams, because I could see that it was very easy to get sucked into these things. I played a lot of um, Quake, Quake 2, uh, Unreal, and Half-Life, but I just uninstalled all of these and um, made my way into the real world and uh, I have never really been back. Zoe on the other hand is a massive gamer. In terms of the novels, yet yeah, again have heard of them. Uh, there is actually three, so it's like a little box set of three Halo, I think it's the Halo Reach or something, I'm not sure, uh, books. I've not read them but Zoe tells me that they're not very good. And sometimes, um, in fact, actually quite often you find this with uh, video game tie-in books. Not so much film tie-in books, but video game tie-in books, because there's, there's not really the depth of story to facilitate um, a good storytelling in a book form. So unless the author had a really strong idea that could be kind of rebranded and repackaged within the video game franchise, 
I don't really think it tends to work, unfortunately, you know, and in film form as well, you make films out of video games. I'm thinking Super Mario Brothers here, uh, quite often if the, 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 if the video game is not readily applicable to the real world, it can be quite tricky, but that's, that's my thoughts on that. What's my favourite film of all time? I think it probably comes down to one of two. Uh, I'm a real, real fan of uh, The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. It's uh, Clint Eastwood, Sergio Leone, Spaghetti Western. It's one of a, a very loose trilogy, actually. It's, it's arguable that the characters aren't the same characters because people like um, Lee Van Cleef plays apparently different characters between the different films. So it's a moot point where the Clint Eastwood's character is the same man with no name throughout it. And I'm not really sure. It doesn't really matter which order you watch those films, and they do stand alone quite well. Uh, but uh, The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, I just love that film. It's a very immersive film, and it's got plenty of atmosphere. And it said that actually when they filmed that, Sergio Leone was very, very keen for the actors to kind of immerse themselves in that sort of stinky Western lifestyle. Um, so... Uh, apparently the, the facilities weren't all the best. Uh, Sergio Leone is a notoriously difficult director to work with. Uh, and apparently Clint Eastwood did fall out with him uh, on that shoot and they never worked together again. In terms of other films, uh, it has to be Blade Runner. Uh, I love that. Again, very atmospheric film. And uh, if I had to pick one from that pair, I'd say... Actually, I'm going to say The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. I think that film uh, rewards re-watching slightly more than Blade Runner. But um, I, I, there's not really a lot between them. I love both those films. Um, I do love a lot of other stuff, um, principally science fiction, actually. It must be said. The Good, The Bad and The Ugly is one of these rare films that isn't sci-fi, but I love it to death. Uh, but yeah, I love Alien, Aliens as well, um, Robocop, um, Terminator, Terminator 2. You know, we're getting a theme going on there, a real sci-fi theme. But if you go for, you know, if you push me like, well, what non-sci-fi films do you like? Um, uh, let's have a think now. I quite like Beer Fest, and if you've ever seen that, it's a bit of a, a, a trashy throwaway comedy film. Uh, I do quite like it. I like the Death Wish films as well. There's a lot of films I like, but uh, we're going to put Good, the Bad and the Ugly up there at the top. Thoughts on American steam locomotives? Um, you know, the Hudsons, the Malay, the Challengers. They're epic. Uh, locomotives really they really do put um the stuff that we had in the uk even the bayer garrets to shame but i think it's all born out of the necessities of the terrain and the landscape um you know i've got nothing against american locomotives I do quite like them but i model uk outline um i've seen some really nice uh american outline models actually over the years and it's my one golden rule is pick a scale, pick a country and stick to it, no matter how beautiful some of these other models appear. And in the UK, um, European outline stuff is fairly readily able to be got. It's very, very expensive, but I do like a lot of the German and even the Scandinavian locomotives too. But American stuff, I think at the right price, I'd probably buy a few and they, you'd find... Uh, I don't, know, I don't know whether a Challenger or a Malay would actually uh, really succeed in getting around the curves out on Boggleton Trinity Road, but, you know, give it a go. Um, there were, of course, some American locomotives that did make it to the UK, the S160, um, the USA Dock Tank, uh, two to, to think of, but then also the narrow gauge Alcos uh, did make it here. Um, so... There are examples of American-made locomotives, then, you know, later still, um, the Class 59s and the Class 66s uh, as well. So, you know, there's a long history of some American products reaching the UK. Um, would I model American outline? Yeah, I think I would. I really do like the vastness of some of the map landscapes. 
and also a lot of the the in, more industrial infrastructure the you know the um, factories that the rail lines serve in America because of the vastness of distances I guess the railroads had a massive foothold which is not so easily shaken by road transport so there's a lot of this infrastructure that disappeared from the UK still exists uh, and is still used uh, in parts of America so certainly it's a really interesting um, area of the world for modelling um, and if it wasn't the fact that I've got so much UK outline stuff, then yeah, if I was starting from scratch, I probably would consider American outline stuff. Right, I've got a question here from Crow T, uh, again through Patreon. And uh, they ask, are you the child waving from the back seat of the Volvo? Uh, I th I'm assuming that they mean the intro uh, that was put together for me. Um, it's actually the second intro that I've had. Within it, there's snippets of footage that are taken from a number of my videos, one of which is some old cine film videos uh, that I put up in three parts quite a while ago. And the car itself is actually, I think it's an Audi, it's either an Audi 80 or an Audi 100. Um, and it was my father's car at the time. Uh, it's not a Volvo. And that bit with all of us waving, yes, I am the child uh, in the back seat of the car. Um, that was us just about to set out on uh, an epic family holiday and we drove to the south of France uh, on a Eurocamp trip. Uh, we used to do that a lot as a family, uh, go tripping around Europe, um, mostly France and Germany, staying in Eurocamp chalet tents and it was really a great time, so much so that Zoe and I have actually done Eurocamp in this country um, uh, that they had some of the chalet tents uh, in the Lake District for a while. And it is quite a, an interesting experience to stay in these tents that you know so well from your childhood, um, but in a, a UK setting. Um, so, yeah, short answer, that is me looking very, very young, because I was. Um, it would have been, it would have been 1980, I think that was. So that's... Oh, 38 years, 37, 38 years ago. Yeah, 37, well, it's about 37 years. It'll be 38 years this year. That's a long time. Oh, it doesn't really bear thinking about, does it? Another question that's also come in through Patreon. Do you think RTR, that's ready to run, uh, should mean ready to repair in Hornby's case? I think that's a bit... Uh, I understand why they've asked this, but I think it's it's perhaps a little bit unfair because I think out of all of the ready-to-run manufacturers that I own models from, the most fragile have actually been Helgen. And um, I've had a lot of issues with bits that just fall readily off Helgen locomotives, such as the um, Metropolitan um, Sarah Siddons type Bobos for the Metropolitan Railway. Um, and they really are far too fragile for their own good. In terms of Hornby, um, I found them reasonably resilient, but again, they do reward careful handling. I think ready to repair is perhaps uh, unfair. You know, I've had Batman locomotives where things have fallen off. I've had Daypole locomotives, the Class 73, I had to re-glue all of the roof vents because it's such a fine detail, but they weren't very well attached and they came off. Luckily, I spotted that it had fallen off uh, before it reached a point where, it, you know, you suddenly find this thing on the carpet and you think, what's that? Oh, a bit of junk. And then it's months later that you suddenly notice one of your locomotives looks a bit peculiar because it's missing that bit that you didn't know what it was. Um, but luckily I, I found it and realised what it was and glued it back on. Um, Backman locomotives do suffer from cab handrails is the big thing that I get on the Class 8 diesel shunters before they went over to the metal handrails. They they broke like nobody's business. Um, I've had steps off the Backman Ginty just miraculously fall off. Um, but certainly Hornby, they are very fragile and it's... Probably a payoff uh, as we get more and more detail 
the, the better the detail, the more fragile it is in that scale. So you have to ask, what do you want? Do you want resilience or do you want a perfect model which really just has to be handled ever so carefully? And, you know, I like a lot of the models that we're getting. I wouldn't for one minute go back to the bad old days in the 1970s and 1980s with moulded on detail, uh, steamroller tread tyres on the, the wheels um, and some really toy-like locomotives. Um, I mean, you only have to look at the Class 8 shunter that's in the Hornby range to see just how bad some of these models actually were. Um, although I was quite lucky as a child, uh, my father was a keen advocate of Hornby 00, so we had what was probably the best Class 8 on the market. It actually looked like a Class 8, even down to the outside frames. Um, and we, you know, until Backman introduced their branch line class eight in the very late 1990s, um, you know, the Hornby 00 one was the best by far. So the upsum of that is, no, I think that <laughs> ready to repair is a little bit harsh, but I do see where you're coming from. But it's something that you could you could rather snidely perhaps apply that to all ready to run manufacturers. Um, it's just a sign of how good a models we're getting. Um, fine details equals fragile. Oh, I was asked, um, there's been some pictures that I put up on um, Twitter that show me in the cab of a West Country class locomotive, the City of Wales. And I was asked, did you, did you actually drive that? Uh, no, I didn't drive that locomotive, but I did sit in the cab whilst it completed a journey from uh, Bury to uh, Haywood. And the video of that has been put up on my channel, so you can go and watch that. It's probably not the most scenic part of the railway, uh, but there were six of us getting the VIP treatment on there. Uh, a reunion tour of uh, the East Lanks Railway so we had to kind of take it in turns because there was only room for one of us in the cab at a time so the section that I got was Berry to Haywood and it was a really good trip actually I thoroughly enjoyed it. Another question that comes up an awful lot a bit of a fun one here to end on um, am I married stroke marry me well uh, first part of that yes I am second part of that um, see the first part really it's as simple as that I am married so you know they've stuck with me for nine years so there we go anyway I hope you've enjoyed this video I hope it's been informative to you don't forget to like this video and share it too and also subscribe to the channel you'll be the first to know about new videos as and when they go up and as I said before uh, those of my Patreons who uh, put forward questions, your questions will get uh, pride of place and top priority in the next question and answer session that we'll be doing in a couple of weeks' time. But until then, you take very good care of yourself. This is me, Jenny Kirk, saying bye for now. Today's video has been brought to you in part thanks to the generous donation of my fans on Patreon. And a special huge thanks goes out to Anthony Kidson and Mark Anthony. If you'd like to help support the show, head on over to patreon.com slash Jennifer Kirk. Thank you. Today's video has been brought to you by my books, Bringing Home the Stars, Twinkle Little Star, and also you can get the complete comic collections of All Over the House, Books 1, Books 2, and also the wacky zany Life of Knobty Mouse. Thanks and catch you later.